Yes. You'll miss uh, a lot of stuff that we did last week. I cannot possibly repeat it, but we discussed the two paintings by Rembrandt of the rape of the suicide of Lucretia. And somebody brought up that it would be interesting to look at the iconography of the, of the whole tradition. And to my surprise, I didn't bring any slides today, but David prepared a little slideshow that we may do first quickly. Okay. Just look at them, and then we'll talk about the verbal works on Lucrezia and what I had prepared for today, and then maybe if there's time we can go back to these slides, okay? Were the titles of the two paintings the same? Uh, yes, yes, but titles are made up later. So Rembrandt didn't give, uh, give the paintings that title. The title is sometimes Lucrezia, the death of Lucrezia, the suicide of Lucrezia, and sometimes the rape of Lucrezia. Is that what you mean? Yeah, but they were named. Uh, the titles are, ne Rembrandt never gave titles. So that's always like 18th century uh, additions. Now we have, maybe we should turn the light off for a little while. Oh, oh dear, mm -hmm. turn, turn the, the slide, the okay. machine off. Okay. So these are going to be paintings I've never seen before. Oh, so I'm. Way. I have to go the other way. Oh, backwards. Yeah. oh backwards. Yeah. Okay. Are they still in the order that you have here yeah. on your list? Oh my God, yeah. yeah. This is the real stuff. Yeah. <laughs> now I suddenly feel so prudish with the paintings I showed you last week. This is really. <clears throat> now this should be the. Uh, I don't know if I can yeah, see it. The Tiepolo. No. no Titian. 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 So if anybody doubts that there was real rape in the Lucretia story, here it is. And you see the sword, which looks pretty interestingly like a dagger, right? The thing she uses later for her uh, suicide. So we just go to the next one and then we'll see if we want to. That's a detail of the same? No. It's a, it's no. It is a detail of another one. It's by the same painter. I think it was a study or something in preparation uh -huh. for the other Oh, painting. I see. It's quite interesting. Uh huh. You see the appeal to the uh, to the viewer in her eyes, while his eyes are kind of ravingly looking at her. Oh, what happens? Other way. Um, I I go backwards though. Okay. Now this is Lorenzo. Hmm. A lady as Lucrezia. Oh my God. Yeah. So Lucrezia, the, the, the tradition was used for portraits. It was used for yeah. portraits. There is a kind of a, an instrument on the table that could be a dagger. Or, but there's no trace of any of the events we have discussed here in this painting. This is the rape of the Sabines. The Sabines? Or rape of... Is this the Botticelli? Yes, Botticelli. Oh, that the, is... The tragedy of oh, Lucretia. OK. This is her body on the forum. Oh, it's nice we have one of those. I guess this yeah, should be... three parts. On the left is her being attacked by uh, Tarkan. Oh, I and see. And on the right is her meeting her father and fiancé, and in the middle is her... Her body. body. I yeah. see. Oh, this is a wonderful one. <laughs> that is quite something about narrative, huh? This is a narrative painting, if ever there was. Now, this is the rape of the Seb Sabines. How do you say that, Sabines? I don't know. Tiepolo. So you say Sabines? OK. You know that story? That's uh, one of the founding stories of Rome also. We are going to talk about it today, about the relation between this rape and the myth of foundation. It's quite ugly, this one. Oh, my god. <laughs> What is this? Gentileschi. Now, which Gentileschi I would like to know? This must be Father Gentileschi or Brother Gentileschi, <laughs> not Sister Gentileschi, <laughs> I would say. I don't know. It's on the slide. Because we don't know why she has to press her breast when she is going to kill herself. So that there is room to stab, yeah, but that's really, she should live. 
<laughs> I don't think this is really... <laughs> it doesn't seem to make sense. No, but if you have seen the, the Lucrezia by Gentileschi, it's quite something different. Okay, this is the Rape of Europa, which is in fact, that's another interesting, I don't know if we talked about that, that uh, the, in English, the same word is used for rape and abduction. Because this is basically an abduction, but an abduction which is obviously going to lead to rape. Like the rape of Helen. And then we have, this is a nice one. The Oath of Brutus. Now, this must be a 19th century French, although I can't read the name. Oh, I, I might be able to decipher it. Um, oh, Beaufort, Jacques Antoine Beaufort, 1771. Uh huh. So that's still 18th century. It, lo it really looks like um, David's oath of uh, the Horatii. The same kind of male determination. And if you see that kind of ready for action attitudes of the man, and, and then that woman laying there, it's quite something, isn't it? <laughs> this is really wonderful. I, I'm going to say more about these when I have worked on them a little more in detail. It's really something. Okay, I think we end the show now, and if we have time to go back to them, it would be nice. Thank you for bringing them, David, and I hope I can borrow them for uh, a little while. Now, this brings us back into the visual sphere right now. It's a pity that I didn't bring the, the two remnants just to briefly re-evoke them. Uh, let's see. Now, did you all, did you look at the, the ancient texts that I told you to look at, the Livy and the Ovid? <coughs> now, if, if you remember about last week what we said, what we have been discussing about the Rembrandts, um, it was clear, if you then compare that to the, um, to the verbal traditions, that in, Rembrandt obviously links up with those traditions without really making another version of them. You cannot say this is the story of Lucrezia as we found it in Livy, because there's too much different. Um, and in the next two sessions, we will talk about this idea of a story that is taken up and what it means to even think that that is what's happening. Right, I'm going to challenge the idea that you have versions of the same story, but that's for, for next time. Um, if we briefly discuss a few points of difference of distinction between those texts and the paintings, um, we can maybe get a hint of the uh, ideological positions taken by each of these artists. By the way, I forgot to say that maybe last time, but I, I, if I did, I would just repeat it, and otherwise I say it for the first time. Please feel free to interrupt and to ask questions while I'm talking. You don't need to be silent for two hours and then wait for five minutes of questions. If you let me speak, I'll speak forever. And that's not what you want. You want to say something, too. So please go ahead. Now, the, the uh, motivation for this session is to get a little more uh, a sense of what visuality and the relation between verbal and visual, word and image, have to do with this question of rape. Because I think there's a, it's not, I didn't pick just a random subject by beginning with rape. It, I think there is a very deep relation that we can only hint at now, but that will come back in the course of the other sessions. Now, if we begin with Livy, Livy's analysis, of which this fragment is a part, are uh, mythical historiography. And mythical historiography is an endeavor directly brought forth by the need for origin. It is a kind of writing that is done to give the nation or the institution or whatever you write for and from an origin, a beginning. That is, the status quo, the republic, which was in force when he wrote it, needs an origin, a cause. And Lucre Lucretia's rape and the rape of the Sabines is another of those. Those rapes have to be the cause, which is thus caused by a need for origin. That it, you see what I mean? If, if the status quo needs an origin, a cause, that will then be said to have brought it forth, what you have, in fact, is that it's the need for origin that creates the cause in a Derridian move of, of reversal, of course. Now, if beginning and follow up, if origin and effect cause and effect, come to call, if beginning and follow up, that is the chronology, chronology, 
come to coincide with cause consequence, with causality, then the problem is then that logical and mythical relations get somehow mixed up, cannot be distinguished, distinguished anymore. Now, this holds for the question of origin, but the moral translation of origin causality is the question of guilt. And you have seen that that question of guilt is very much in, uh, involved in this problem. Guilt leads logically to punishment as cause to effect, right? So if you start, if there again you take the status quo, the rape, and you're, you're looking for a cause, a moral cause, you get who caused it, who is guilty. And now this is a relation that is, of course, as vulnerable as the normal logical causality. And that is why, because of the fragility of that relation, there is this insistence in Livy on guilt. Now, I quote what, Lu what Lucretia says to her father and her husband when they try to comfort her and tell her, well, it's, not, it's really not your fault, right? What she says is, though I acquit myself of the sin, I do not absolve myself from punishment. Now, this is a very platonic duality that is uh, figured here. But what she does is identifying rapist and victim, of course, because the one is, is guilty and the other is guiltless, and who deserves the punishment? Now, the logic of guilt and punishment is breaking down here, the identification between uh, victim and rapist is uh, a perversion of that relationship. That is, she who has been made the victim by the guilt of the other takes it upon herself to be punished and thus causes her own punishment. That is, although the need to be punished is a consequence of the rape, it becomes the cause of the suicide. Lucretia had already separated those two aspects of the same person in a little uh, uh, quote a little before when she said my body alone and this is even more platonic my body alone has been violated my spirit is guiltless that's the that's sh that quote comes in fact in the order of the text come first so she separates her body and her spirit her mind and the one has been violated and the other is guiltless but there, that's not an opposition violated and guilt so it's really a strange uh, duality that she's setting up there. And that separation of body and mind, in fact, undermines, is undermined in her separation of guilt and punishment. Because if your mind is guiltless, how can you then be punished? You destroy the relationship, the causal relationship between crime and punishment, if you do that. Uh, punishment directed to the body alone, because the mind is guiltless. Punishment directed to the body alone is sheer violence, torture, if you wish, but not punishment. About torture, by the way, I, I can, if you're interested in that uh, fascinating question of torture, you can read um, Elaine Scarry, if you heard about The Body in Pain, a wonderful book that appeared in 85, I think with Oxford University Press, could be Cambridge, I always mix them up. A wonderful book that um, is about pain and about torture, war, about Judaism, Marxism. About, it looks a little random as a set of subjects, but it's all about pain and it's wonderful. And it's, she comes out of uh, uh, English and comparative literature. It's really very interesting. Now, these two statements that I just quoted, my body alone has been violated, my spirit is guiltless on the one hand, and though I acquit myself of the sin, I do not absol absolve myself from the punishment. If you take those two equally contradictory to get, uh, statements together, you have a kind of chiastic uh, double contradiction. And the only solution to that contradiction seems to be the identification with the rapist, hence with the guilt. That is the way she can seem apparently be logical. And the paradox is that this is the only way, and I said this, that last week already, that this identification is the only way to uh, for the victim to retain some sort of subjective uh, power of action. And that mechanism is so strongly at work in Livy's text that it is even, it's, it's exploding almost in every detail of the text. One example among many is the pun that uh, has been commented upon a lot by classicists, 
depend on hospitality. Sextus Tarquinius is he who last night returned hostility for hospitality, right? Remember that? Hostis pro hospite in Latin. Now, the two words derive from the same root. And that, in, even in English, by the way, that you can still see that there's a pun. And that root expresses two, oppo two opposed attitudes towards strangers, towards the other, right? Um, the, the nice and hospitable relationship and then the hostile relationship. And that makes sense if you think of the context in the uh, Mediterranean antiquity where traveling was really, uh, you must know about this, traveling was such a dangerous endeavor that um, on the one hand, a stranger was by definition dangerous. On the other hand, always in danger. And hospitality was a kind of sacred duty. And breaking hospitality is the, you know, one of the major taboos in, in, in the, those cultures. And that's, in fact, what he did. He didn't break hospitality, but he, he misused her hospitality, right? Which is also a kind of an abuse of the same order. Now, the strong similitude between the two words, hostess, Hostis pro hospite emphasizes the unexpected identity whereby hospitality becomes a metaphor for hostility. And that is one of the ways in which, just by the sheer coincidence of those two words, one of the ways in which there is this suggestion of a causal metonymical relation between hospitality and hostility. That is, hospitality causes hostility. That is what you, what you get the message that you get if you read this quickly. And this, this brings us back to the well-known territory of the victim has provoked her own rape, right? Lucrezia somehow, by being hospitable, made it possible for him to turn, his, uh, to turn hospitality into a hostility. Now, <clears throat> there, is, there is one aspect in this tradition, in the, in the texts that we are discussing today, that is the two uh, the two antique texts, the Roman texts, and then uh, the Shakespeare. The, maybe the most disturbing aspect of this tradition is the management of voice, of narrative voice, which is the other side of the word image uh, pair of terms. <laughs> the subject of the semiotic acts, who speaks, the question of who speaks. Now, I started last week with a silenced woman, Emma, in the, in the Freudian letters who was audible by means of the reading that I proposed, this hysterical reading, this visual reading, th but through a male voice. Now, here it's even worse. Um, and compared to Emma, in fact, Rembrandt gave a lot of voice, visual voice, to his Lucrezia by all these addresses to the audience that he built in. Now, um, Livy's Lucrezia, in contrast, is worse than... Uh, is worse off than uh, Freud's Emma, a lot worse. She is a woman speaking, but she's speaking the male view of rape by all these things, like this pun and uh, the, uh, the separation of body and spirit and then this crazy causality that leads to her guilt. She speaks this male voice, this male view through the mediation of a man, and nowhere is this clearer than when she represents and justifies male fear and hostility. And I'll come to some examples. And about her experience of rape, nothing in these two texts. I'm not talking about Shakespeare here, because there's a lot of sh in Shakespeare of her experience. But in Livy and in Ovid, there's nothing about her experience. Now, for example, if we, if we look at the rape scene itself, and we'll later compare or bring in the, uh, another a rape scene of the more, more contemporary texts. The rape scene itself, here is the quote. With this terror, his lust, he was threatening her, remember, that he would kill a slave and then tell everybody that he had found her uh, making love with a slave. <coughs> and with this terror, his lust gained the victory. Victorious, and the latter word here is victrix, which is a female uh, uh, word victorious as if by violence over her obstinate chastity. And when Tarquinius had left after the conquest of the woman's honor, etc., then, okay, now this is all you have, this, the rape scene itself. 
Our two aspects are interesting here for the purpose of this seminar. First, the rape itself as an act and as an experience is skipped over. You have the threat and then immediately the other side. And second, the vocabulary here is military. And you see why I'm bringing this up. We see that in Shakespeare. Shakespeare almost makes a parody of this by making the whole vocabulary completely military. Although this military rhetoric in, in Shakespeare times is completely uh, commonplace and maybe also kind of conventional in, in the Roman uh, antiquity, it is more than that. It shows that rape is a fight, a war, a war between the sexes, which the man, to which the man comes fully armed. And we saw that in one of your slides, right, in, in the fourth, where he comes with a dagger. The drawn sword, which in Livy, um, with, with which Tarquinius, uh, Tarquin in Livy approaches his defenseless, sleeping, defenseless, sleeping victim, is not only a metaphor for his real weapon, that is also, of course, in a Freudian reading, is very clearly uh, also a, 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 the drawn penis, I would say. But it's not only that. As a metonymy, it announces the later self-killing, because it's the same weapon, and that's so nice in that one slide that it's the same weapon. And it shows that his sword causes that suicide. But also, on another level, it's expresses his own insecurity. It feeds the idea that the victim is dangerous because why the hell that does he need a sword when he comes to a sleeping woman? He's strong enough as a man, right, to uh, go about his business of raping without sword. He doesn't need a sword at all. It's absolutely superfluous. And in a text that is very scarce in detail in other, in other moments, this is really interesting. But there is more in this, in this quote. There is something about rhetoric. With his terror, his lust gained the victory, victorious as if by violence. Now, violence is here represented as a comparison. Victorious as if by violence. The as if structure can be seen here as an ideological code. And in the common ideas about literal and figurative language, violence would then be only a figure of speech, superfluous and ornamental. Now, why, why this as if here? It doesn't make sense since there's real violence. Ovid, on this, this is in Livy, but Ovid exploits this possible interpretation by representing Tarquin as a passionate lover. There's no violence at all there, he's just in love. Now, the military language in this quote deconstructs this hierarchy by showing what is primary and secondary. Taking seriously this, this military color of the language um, and in, as, as a hysterical, as I said last week, hysterical tendency to concrete reading, take this as something very concrete, it becomes a vital strategy to, uh, to read this military language as it really is in the structure of the language, rather than seeing in the sentence the suggestion that her resistance enforces his violence, which is one way of reading it, and is, of course, the traditional reading, and thus m making the scene military because it is so, so, such a dangerous situation for him, it seems clear to me that, in fact, what this as if structure is also saying is that his violence needs the rhetorical device of comparison as an apology, as an excuse. So the comparison as if by violence then becomes a hysterical direction of use, a statement on the relation between literal and figurative between reality and ornamental. The comparison must prove that rhetoric surpasses reality, in fact, because that's what we know. We know that there's violence, and if it then says as if by violence, we must say, okay, language seems to be the more, the, 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 this decoration seems to be where it, the, the real message is. And if you do that, the interpretation, it is no real violence, it only seems so, is then superseded by a second interpretation, the rhetoric, the language, is more important than reality, which then we can appropriate and say, hence, the important thing about rape is the language. That is, we want to know what someone is saying about it, but then we want to know, of course, what the victim would be saying about it. And this reversal 
allows us to activate uh, still another meaning of the ambiguous Latin word for violence, because this word, um, where did I have the word? Uh, I don't have it here. It's, it, it's, what is the word for violence in Latin? I forgot. I just, ready? yes. Oh, OK. It just escaped me. Um, did you find the sentence I was talking about? No, I didn't. Well, it's, well, it just escaped me. It, it's a word that means violence, but also strength. Huh? Yes, of course. Yes, peace. Yeah. It also means strength. Yeah, it's very close to that. But then what it means, in fact, if you say as if by violence, and you look at that ambiguous word, you can say it means also my strength is just a manner of speaking, as if by strength, as if I were strong. And the drawn sword substantiates that interpretation. He doesn't feel that strong. So the insecurity about his own strength, which made him draw his sword, his superfluous weapon, thus turns the rape into a test of force and of power, a test of his, his insecure masculinity. And that is, in fact, that, the, that insecurity is the violent enemy that the woman is facing in a situation of rape. And I think there again we have something that we can take out of this text, that text that is disturbingly on the male side in this, in this rape story. We, it yet allows us to understand something about rape. Now, the alienating use of the victim's voice, which we started out about, for the verbalization of a male view can thus be countered by the operation of the reversals and displacements that we are trying to, to map out. Now, two kinds of reversals are crucial for this endeavor. Um, and that is the reversal of figurative and, and literal, of decorative and essential. And we know very well that there is very little essential about language and that, in fact, we could say that all of language is decorative or none of it is, and that of verbal and visual. And that's what I want to get at. Now, in Freud's verbal account, we have seen how the visual image of the scene helped to recover Emma's experience. We have seen how Rembrandt's paintings allowed for a reading based upon rhetoric, which is almost a verbal reading. So the verbal text allowed for a visual reading, and the visual text allowed for a verbal reading. Now, the rivalry between verbal and visual, and that is the reason why I started out with the Lucrezia tradition, is by no means accidental to the sex war of rape. It is no coincidence that the rape of Lucrezia is represented as caused by a visual image, the sight of her beauty and chastity, of her exclusive belonging to one man, that is. Well, that visual image, and that is the interesting thing, is first evoked verbally by the competing husband who owns her. <coughs> You remember that it's the two the soldiers are sitting together and are boasting about all their about their wives and who has the most beautiful and the most virtuous wife, and then uh, Colatine comes up with the description of his Lucretia and that's such a convincing description that they go out and look. So there is something here about verbal and visual that is very crucial. Now this husband Colatine boasts in beautiful rhetorical language, and what is he saying in this? This, this stream of words, he's saying, that words are superfluous and that sight is crucial. And this is a real paradox. What he says at the end of his boasting, of his rhetorical performance, he says, let every man regard as the surest test what meets his eyes when the woman's hand husband enters unexpected. So here again, the importance is not only her beauty, but the degree to which her husband owns that beauty, that is, the exclusive possession, that she's going to be really his. By entering unexpected, you can witness that, right? Now, there is a voyeurism here encouraged, and it is precisely this voyeurism that will lead to rape. We'll come back to voyeurism in a few weeks more at length. But it is not simply the gaze directed at the exciting side of female beauty, but it's the side of her possession by the other man that is supposed to be the important thing. The emphasis on the visual hardly conceals the crucial impact of language as the attraction of the woman 
hardly conceals the real target, that is, the other man. This quote clearly says that what we are going to see is to what extent she's mine, right? Now, this is, in the, you find this again in Ovid, Ovid's fragment, which I have uh, studied in less detail than uh, Livy's, but on this it's really also interesting. In Ovid's fragment, Collatine's statement has been replaced by an equally ambiguous one. Here are the words, non opus esse verbis credita rebus, 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 sorry, credita rebus, accusative. And it's translated by Fraser, whose, whose uh, edition I use, as no words are needed, trust deeds. Now this is a, transla deeds is a translation of rebus, which is possible, but not necessary. It's not a necessary choice between the possible meanings of, again, an ambiguous noun, res. And this choice shifts, uh, choice shifts from sight, trust things, which would be a more obvious translation, to male interaction, trust deeds. And that's advice that Tarquin is going to adopt eagerly. Right? He is going to do deeds. Thus showing that sight and deed, the sight of the woman, and her rape are the same thing in this word, rebus. Now, in Shakespeare, this is even more interesting. Shakespeare resolves this paradox between words and image, between sight and, and uh, the rhetorical evocation of it, in his own way. For him, the words alone, I don't know if you read the Shakespeare, but for him, the words alone produce the visual image. Strongly enough, and the rape is decided, Tarquin decides that he goes to Rome to rape her. He, the rapist decided before, before he had so much as seen the woman. So he didn't need it. Although he sees her through her husband's voice. Here's what it says, what Shakespeare says. While Tarquin, while Collatine is praising his wife, describing her beauty, describing her virtue in an absolutely military language. Those of you who read it will remember that. It's, it's described as a battlefield between beauty and virtue. Now, he hears about Collatine's response to that. Therefore, that praise with which Collatine doth owe enchanted Tarquin answers with surmise in silent wonder of still gazing eyes. And between still and gazing, there is a hyphen. So it's, he's, he's absolutely um, fascinated in the, in the etymological sense. Now, you have on the one hand Collatine's logoria, his stream of words that is, comes out of kind of sickening and sick uh, need to talk. And in response to that, Tar Tarquin is completely dumbfolded. He cannot say anything. He's absolutely staring. His eyes stare at the image produced by Collatine's words. So here you have really the moment where visual and verbal are the same thing. But the rhetoric is still military. The image produced, visual as it is, is one of war. So the, the, what happens, in fact, is that this ultimate coincidence of visual and verbal happens at the moment of war. And so you wonder what Tarquin is, in fact, seeing with his still gazing eyes. Is he seeing an attractive woman or a Medusa? Because the, t the terminology is so military that you could, can hardly, there is nothing attractive about the picture at all. Is he overcome by desire or by fear? And then we remember the sword. In any case, he's contaminated by the logoria that makes him sick, dangerously and deadly sick, although the danger is displaced from him on the victim. Now, after the rape, Shakespeare's Lucretia is in so much of despair that she doesn't know what to do. But here, Shakespeare is completely different from the sources, and therefore, Shakespeare's text can hardly be seen as a version of the old story. By all the attention he pays to her experience, to her sense of what happened. And this is really interesting. What happens then is that her despair is in the first place caused by her frustration about her incapacity to speak her experience. That's what she says. I cannot say what happened. In contrast with the verbally, verbally evoked visuality that condemned her, this image evoked by the husband who speaks so well, she sharply feels the in inadequacy, 
that language of the language that the man masters so well. And she seeks comfort. And where does she seek comfort? In a painting. So it's, it's the immediate thing, if, you, if language is not helping you, is to go to visual image. And she goes to a painting of the Trojan War, a painting that is described by Shakespeare. And this is really, if any of you is a good painter or, or draw, drawsman, you should try to, to paint this painting out of the description. I was, once did that with the cap of Charles and Madame Bovary. Yeah. And you, you get a monster. Now, this painting must be a monster, too, a very interesting kind of contemporary painting, probably. A painting, the painting is full of eyes. That is, visuality is thematized in the painting, not only by the painting that represents visuality, but it's also full of indications that, of looking. Now, just a description of a part of the painting, and you'll remember that it's a long description. It's almost half of the whole text. And this really is, is so insistent on, so such an insistent inscription of the visual that one wonders why this visual is so important. Here's a quote, just a piece. And from the towers of Troy, there would appear the very eyes of man through loopholes thrust, gazing upon the Greeks with little lust. Such sweet observance in this work was had that one might see those far off eyes look sad. Now, if this is, this is like seven instances of visuality in, 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 six, in five lines of poetry, and that is quite remarkable. Through the visual language that, that Lucrezia is here uttering, she identifies with one of the characters in the painting. Now, with whom? Not with Helen, although she makes mention of Helen's rape. And that is a case where abduction and rape are in English the same, which is an ambiguity that does not exist in all the other languages. But she identifies with old Hecuba, you know, the old mother who lost her son. And the motivation for that identification is also given by Shakespeare. Here's what she said. Well, it's not, um, yeah, the, the she here in the quote is Hecuba, not Lucretia. Of what she was, no semblance did remain. That is, she identifies with Hecuba because Hecuba is a destroyed subject. And the destruction of the subject is represented visually, the semblance. She sees that the subject has been destroyed by comparison of before the rape, before the death of her son, before all the misery of the war, and after. Now, of course, not to speak of the fact that he was, again, a war, that is the situation that she identifies with. So by not seeing her semblance of her former self, Lucretia can grasp somehow what happened to herself through Hecuba. Now, the visual cannot really replace language. This is really. Once we are through with this painting and we think that we have found a solution to the inadequacy of language by the visual, then she says, but this is not language, and that's, so it's not enough. Lucrezia blames the artist. And we get here, of course, also the, the rivalry between the, the, poem, the poet and the painter. That is a very conventional topic in the, in the Renaissance. Lucrezia blames the artist for to give her so much grief and not a tongue. That is, the visual artist is always inadequate because she cannot, she cannot speak. The painted Hecuba is like the sick Emma, deprived of speech, reduced to spectacle, but as such, audible. That is, she is the best Lucretia can get. And that is an interesting kind of limit of, of the power. So language fails, then the visual helps. But the visual will also always fail because it's not language. Right? You see the paradox that he's called in here. Now, the, it is interesting, just as Livy needed the rape of Lucretia to create the history, the origin of Rome, just so Shakespeare needs the rape of Lucretia to make his statement about the arts. And I think that is a very deeply anchored uh, cultural uh, image, maybe, that um, that there, there, there is somehow a relationship between 
visuality and, and this struggle between poetry and, and visual art that was very, a very hot topic through the, the 18th century and uh, into the 19th, and it's not disappeared today. And the gender difference and the fact that women are associated with the visual and men with words, as we see in these older texts. Now, here, as in Emma's case, the spectacle is productive, although it is never adequate, and although she says that it's not enough, it is very productive if we know how to use it. It allows Lucrezia to express her inexpressible experience, and what Shakespeare, in fact, is doing by this description is what I try to do with Emma, that is make a case for visual reading. And a, a visual reading based on language would solve the problem of the competition between the two arts. Now, semblance is the key word in this identification. The key notion of rhetoric also, as if by violence, the comparison. And that is that notion of semblance bridges the gap between self and other that Lucrezia needed for the expression of her experience. You s begin to see why I would use this case to kick off this seminar on, on verbal and visual. Right? Now, the tension of between language and image goes on but to be played out, and it's nowhere more impressively played out than in the episodes following the rape and the self-killing. You know, there is a final episode that we didn't talk about, although I evoked it briefly. And we saw it in one of the slides, the expo uh, exposition, the exhibition of Lucretia's body. In the Roman legend, Lucretia's rape and murder are recuperated for a male cause of ambition, political cause, by the semiotic use of her blood. When he, Brutus, <coughs> takes the dagger out of the dripping dagger out of her body and goes outside and says, look, 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 what happened? He's making it entirely public. Thus, her rape and death become central in the public domain to the extent that they are violations of her husband's property. So in fact, it's not so much her experience that is used for this public cause, but the, 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 the theft of her inflicted on her husband. Now, this, this really brings us to a, a still older story, a story in the Hebrew Bible that I have lectures about here in this university last year, so I won't go into the details of that, but I will just evoke the case because it is a very interesting parallel. The story of Judges 19 that I asked you to read, did you read it? Now, I'm sure you were shocked to find that in the Bible, that story. Right? It's the most horrible story, wasn't it? of the rejection, torture, gang rape, murder, and dismemberment of a woman. These are just, no, it's, I'm not exaggerating. This is what happens, right? But there is even a more disturbing instance there of this misuse that Brutus makes of, of uh, Lucretia's body. It is kind of the same thing, in fact, but then more, um, more radical. I don't need to summarize the story since you read it, so that saves a few minutes. Now, this political, public use of the raped woman is not only, as is so often claimed, evidence that the story is allegory, allegorical in nature, which I think is an interpretation that doesn't explain anything, because allegory is a metaphor, and a metaphor needs a motivation. Now, in order to be understood as allegory, it needs to be based on some understandable connection, and that is what I'm talking about, that connection is obviously in the culture. Now, a semiotic analysis of the relations between the episodes shows that it is precisely because allegory metaphor is not enough that the next episode, the semiotic use of the rape body, is needed. Otherwise, we wouldn't need that episode at all. You could just say, look, he was raped. That's like tyranny. We have to make a revolution. You don't need to do this. Why do you have to drag her body out on the marketplace? Why do you have to cut her body up into pieces and send it all through Israel? The bloody knife and the pieces of flesh are used because metonymy and synecdoche are stronger, I would, I'm tempted to say more penetrating, signs than sheer metaphor. The fight over the signs has to be somehow a real fight with real issues. Why? Because the rivaling men in the story need to literally touch the woman's body 
to be in touch, to partake in its rape. Catherine Stimson wrote about Shakespeare's Lucrezia, men rape what other men possess. Shakespeare himself says, talks about it as, as early as in the second verse of his Lucrezia. He talks about false desire. And we remember René Girard's aimer selon l'autre, the phrase which, with which he explains romantic love as kind of false desire also. And then we remember Yves Sedgwick, wonderful book, Between Men, on homosocial desire and the English novel. You know that book? It's also very worthwhile to read. Now, all these expressions, between men, false desire, et mais selon l'autre, etc., they say, why men rape? Because other men possess something they don't. But also, it implies what rape is. That is, a public semiotic act, an act of body language spoken to other men through and in a woman's body. That is what rape is that we can take out of these expressions. Now, in in my book, Death and the Symmetry, that I am publishing next fall with Chicago Press, I developed the argument that the specific act of rape as a semiotic message conveyed to other men is related. And this may be an argument that I summarized too quickly here, but that's to gain time. It's related to the arbitrariness, the sense of arbitrariness attached to fatherhood, as opposed to motherhood, which is more uh, based on contiguity. Fatherhood is, in a sense, an abstraction. It's something that you have to know. It's kind of a metaphor. The act of rape is the violent appropriation of the body that belongs to another man, father or husband, by bodily contiguity. It's kind of making up for this sense of fatherhood as insufficient as inadequate. The case of Judges 19 is particularly convincing in this, for this claim. If you read it, you are going to understand this. If you didn't, it's maybe just just interrupt if, if it's too quick, this, this summary of my claim. The man in the city where the couple spends the night in Gibeah, those inhabitants of the city who seem to turn gay overnight, right? Because they threaten to rape the men first. Now, these men belong to the culture of the woman's father and participate in a culture that is based on what is sometimes called nomadic marriage, which I prefer to call patrilocal marriage, a form of marriage where the daughter remains in the house of the father after marriage and where the husband comes and visits irregularly. You can understand that as a completely different marriage, especially in terms of the children. And I don't know if you know the story of Rachel and Leah, the Jacob, uh, Jacob's wives. Jacob lives with their father in their house. And when he wants to move out and take the whole family back to his father's clan, Laban, the father of the two women, says, her children are mine. And within the institution that we are talking about, that's true. So you see that the issue is the is descent, the line of descent. How is the line established? Now, the attempt in Judges 19 of the husband to take the daughter out of the father's house violates a basic tenet of patrilocal culture contiguity of fatherhood. I call this patrilocal, by the way, <coughs> not in the way that the term is used in anthropology, because I think in anthropology it's not used properly. I made up the term, and I maintain it because I think it's the best term. Anthropologists would, would call this matrilocal marriage. But the position of the father being the issue, I don't think that we have to falsify the perspective by claiming that the mother has some power, because there's no mother in the story. I don't know if you were struck by that. No mother at all. N neither in Judges nor in Lucrezia, by the way. Now, the arbitrariness perceived in any sexual relation outside of the father house, that is, as long as the woman receives her husband in the father's house, it's for the good of the father's line, and the husband just serves as a, a donor, almost. But as soon as there is a sexual relationship outside of that house, there is an arbitrariness. She can, a woman who goes outside of the father's house can go anywhere with any man. And that reflects the arbitrariness of the semiotic relation between sign and meaning that we now have inherited from Saussure. Now, that arbitrariness is particularly upsetting to the man of Gibeah who belongs to that patrilocal cult. <coughs> the daughter taken out of the house belongs not simply to another man, but to any man. 
Hence, to every man. Hence, the gang rape. They're just taking this, well, this act of the husband that they perceive as arbitrary as they take it to the letter. And this idea of public property as the only alternative to contiguity is exactly the foundation of rape. The act then ironically presents an iconic image of both possibilities, rape as an arbitrary, as an arbitrary appropriation by means of contiguity and rape as an arbitrary sign-meaning relation. That is, what does the woman have to do with the rivalry between the men? Rape is arbitrary for her, because if it's a question of competition between men and between institutions that reflect different interests for men, it's absolutely arbitrary to go and rape her. Now, this semiotic aspect of rape resolves the paradox of the competition between words and images, between rhetoric and real facts, which Livy, Ovid, and Shakespeare, and in his own way and medium, Rembrandt, brought to the fore. The meaning of the speech act of rape is hatred, a hatred spoken through metonymy, but not directed to the object. The hatred comes from fear and is acted out, spoken, through the body of the object of fear. And rape is, in this sense, a speech act that reduces its sign to silence, which is a new paradox to solve the old one. Reducing her to the sign status, to the status of sign, as the husband in Judges does, literally, when he sends out the pieces of the woman's body as a message. I mean, he really almost goes to the post office, stamps them, and there they go. Is only an extreme variant of the common cultural attitude towards rape. That is, this idea of taking the woman as public, as standing for something else, as a sign, but ignoring her. As the speaking of rape is exclusively done by men, while it consists of reducing the victim to silence, speaking about rape is also a male prerogative. The women have become spectacles, images. Here we are back into the visual. Images, this woman on the forum, these pieces of flesh. Imagine, just imagine that you get by the mail a package, you open it, there it is. This, this status, the women have become spectacle images, and it is only when we take these images of them as raped, as primary, as literal, and as real, as visual, that is, that we are able to make them speak. The women are in, uh, I, like, I like to play on the title of this wonderful book by Shoshana Thelman. These ca are cases where you can say this is the scandal of the, f of the speaking body. The scandal, the scandal du corps parlant. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the title has disappeared in the English translation of her book, which is the Dell title, Literary Speech Acts. I can't believe it. <laughs> if you have a wonderful title like that, Le Scandale du corps parlant, you turn it into literary speech acts. I know it's not her fault. It's the press who wanted it. But um, that is exactly what I would call the scandal of the speaking body. That is this paradox that the body is used as sign by silencing it, by making it. So it speaks, but it does not speak for itself. Now, with this in mind, with all, all these relations, all these rhetorical devices, etc., I have been examining a few stories of rape by women, contemporary stories, just to see where the different, which crucial differences we can notice. And I've been studying uh, uh, the rape of Chevy that I told you to read if you had the time. Did, did some of you read it? Oh, no. You haven't been able to read it. Well, order it and read it if you have to do it in two months. But it's a wonderful novel. It's a Nigerian author who lives in London. It's, well, I briefly summarize it. It's a story of, uh, uh, it's a kind of fable. It's a story of a community in Africa where whites have never been. And then suddenly there is a plane that, uh, uh, that lands, has an accident, and lands there, a plane with a few people in it, a small plane, whites. And the whites are called albinos by the blacks, which I like really very much as, as a counterpart of Negro. Albinos. Now, the albinos are weird people, of course. They treat those people uh, in incredible ways. And this whole community of Chevy, which has these ideals of 
uh, democracy and uh, politeness and civilization and extremely civilized uh, culture is destroyed in a few months by these people. And rape becomes there also the crucial act. So there you have again a rape that is political, that is related to politics. I also read um, The House of the Spirits. You have, some of you may have read that by Isabella Allende, a bestseller of last year or two years ago, where you have rape also related to uh, politics. And then a novel that is, as a feminist novel, has a special status, uh, the, the Women's Room by Marilyn French. Now, at least you've seen that, where there's also rape. Okay, now. And then a fairy tale and a real rape story. Okay, those were my texts. Now, I'm going to give you a few examples of where these texts, written by women, except for the fairy tale, I come back to that, are different. And, it, and they are different, not only and not even primarily, because uh, the, the women's experience is done more justice. That is obvious. But more subtly, the relationship between the rapes and political violence are shown to be much more intricate than in these traditional cases where the rape is just used as a metaphor for political purposes. Now, first, in the women's stories that I have read, the rape does not lead to a revolution. It is one. It's part of one. Secondly, the female perspective does not lead to a replacement of the male one. It's not symmetrical. You cannot say in the male stories that you, you have the male view, in the women's stories you have the women's uh, view, the, the female view. That's not the case. The men, the rapists, are attended to with surprising detail. And that is not so surprising if we realize that for women, attending to the question of why the rape is vital. It's the only way to overcome the feeling of complete distraction. So you have no symmetry between the two sets. And this question is dealt with in semiotic terms, this question of why rape. Lack of understanding the signs rather than rhetorical rivalry between word and image, which was so crucial in the te traditional text, causes rape in this text by women. Although it is, again, the sight of the women, their images, which entice the rapists, the texts represent not the silenced image of a voiceless woman, but active women whose activity is denied meaning. And that is the basis for the rape. So the rape is based on semiotic incompetence on the part of the rapist. Now, this is just a brief summary of, of what I found in these stories. There is a lot more to say, of course, but that would be really too, uh, too long now. But if we look at just the two extremes, let's say on a scale from real reportage to pure fiction, the real rape story and the fairy tale that I also studied. Now, the real story was written five years after the fact, after the double rape of a young woman. I call her Lita, just because I had to give her a name, during a vacation in the south of Spain. So this woman was out of her own culture, out of her own country, and she was raped by two natives, two people living there. The fairy tale is a grim tale, and it's a very grim tale. You know, um, you may know it, because it's very much discussed these days, especially in feminist circles, of course. And the comparison between these two cases shows really why how important it is to practice what I call hysterical poetics as a strategy of reading. Now, first the story of Lita, this, this woman, extremely soberly written in three pages without giving any, any thought. She wrote it in front of me in five minutes. I asked her, without any preparation, could you write down for me the story of your rape? And she started writing. So there's no artifice, no, no aesthetic reflection or whatever. Here is a description an image that is part of her report. So th remember, there were two men raping her in a car, one after the other. And while the one was raping her, the other was guarding the doors. Now, while the first was fucking me, I saw the big man walking around, around the car, waiting for his turn. Now, she saw. Here's the, visib the, the visuality introduced. Later, I asked her, without mentioning this passage, what was the most frightening moment, and this was exactly what she referred to. The most, I asked her for the narrative moment, the most frightening moment, and she refers me to an image. Now, this image represents the victim, victim's experience, 
And we can read it hysterically in three different ways. First of all, the image is what she said in the Lucrezia stories. It would be so interesting to see what they would come up with if those, those male authors, if they were pressed to, uh, to, to put that in their text. Now, secondly, there is the fear of the second rapist. She, this was during the first rape that she saw this image. And, and what she did, in fact, and that's elsewhere in her story, is she tried to talk the first rapist into some kind of conspiracy with her against the, the second man, like pretending that, she was, that he was not really raping her if he would only ward off the second rape, trying to play on his competition with the other man. And of course, he seemed to comply, but only deceptively so. Um, and the most horrible moment then was the moment that she realized that she had kind of raped herself by pretending this in vain. Um, and then the view of the fat man walking around this, she said that this fat man, this second man, was more repulsive somehow than the first, although they were both repulsive as rapists. But the, the second man was for her kind of more repulsive. Now, the view of that fat man walking around the car predicts the next experience of rape by conveying the feeling of alienation. And then thirdly, the man is represented as a guard who keeps her locked in, this, this walking around the car. And this makes, this represents the collaboration between the two men and turns the rape from an accident into a systematic structural relation in which she is imprisoned. And that's what makes it so horrible. She later she also said that she, that this moment we, when, what happened is I asked her to write this story and then we went over it together afterwards, but I kept it as she wrote it. She, um, she had a sense that uh, at the moment that this man was already turning around her car, the car, she tried to comply with the first, knowing that it wouldn't work. And then the moment he began, he opened the door and came in. Uh, she had a sense that, he, that this could go on forever. That is, you could go into the situation of Judges 19. They could bring him, bring her to her, their friends and give her from the one, hand her over. That was the sense. If two men can rape you, there is no reason why there would be an end to it. And actually that happens often. You, you will read those no, newspaper items where women scream for help and then the, the so-called helper joins in the rape. And, and does it also, that happens also quite often. Now these three aspects of this image together represent a perspective of repetition without hope for liberation. And this visual image that is therefore, for these three reasons, the most frightening moment of the experience. Now the fairy tale. It's a, a fairy tale that is written down in the 19th century by man, by the brothers Grimm. But it represents doubtlessly an earlier oral tale used by elder women to warn young girls. It has all the characteristics of one of those warning tales. Some people claim that Little Red Riding Hood is one of those, right? A tale to warn children what to avoid, the danger, or about the dangers. Now, Grimm's fictional rape story can serve as an allegory, if we can now do that for once, of the importance of hysterics. Now, here's the tale. It's called the Robber Groom, the Rauber, the Rauber Bräutigam. It is in the pocket um, penguin of, of Grimm fairy tales, so it's easily accessible. It's about a miller's daughter who is promised by her father to a frightening man, engaged to be married to a frightening man. The girl feels the repulsion that tells her that the man is bad. And she says, for example, her heart contracted with horror every time she looked at him or thought of him. And of course, in a fairy tale, we don't ask why she then has to go on with this, this engagement. But she takes the warning of her own heart seriously, though. And she takes measures when she has to go on his request to visit the man at his house in the middle of the forest, as always in fairy tales. It always happens in the forest. And she goes in, and then there is a bird that tells her, don't go in, it's a dangerous place. And then she still goes in, but she takes these measures like dropping stones to find her way back or carving in the trees. It's in different versions, uh, like you see in, in many fairy tales. Then when she is in the house, there is an old woman who also tells her this is a dangerous place. And then as soon as she's in there, there is the, the man comes in with his friends, and they bring in a young girl. 
and that girl is going to be raped and murdered. And she witnesses that. And then they want her, the, the robbers want her ring. There's always a displacement of force of rape. It's never real rape in fairy tales, but it's very clear that she's put on the table and cut <coughs> de to death. And then they want her finger because there's a ring and the ring will go, come off the finger. And they cut the finger and the finger leaps right into the other girl's lap of all places. Now, that is a moment of real danger, right? Because now they are going to look for the ring. This is also part of this traditional genre of warning fairy tales, that there has to be a moment of absolute danger. And if you overcome that, then you are grown up as kind of initiation also. Now, she keeps the finger. They can't find her. With the help of the woman, she gets back out when the guys are sleeping, and she goes back home. And then the next time her fiancé comes for a visit, she tells her story in the presence of her father, brothers, and this man. And she is listened to. Thanks to her story and the man's attention, the criminals are called and justice is done, of course. Happy ending. But at, in a, at the, when she tells her story, she comes up with the finger, with the ring and, and the, the whole, the, this whole piece of the body. Yes, again, this metonymy. Uh, well, I would say here, uh, synecdoche. Now, what is interesting here are three aspects that are that differentiate this text from the male text as we have seen, and that's the evidence that I have that this must have a, a female tradition as the background. The, present, the presence of the helping mother figure, the old woman, the girl's solidarity with the other rapable woman, and the girl who is this member, man she, that is the girl who is this member, man she witnesses and whose finger she takes home as evidence. That's the second thing. And then the importance of telling her story which you never see in the male text. You saw Lucrezia struggling with it in Shakespeare. That's as far as you can go. Now, an old woman who lives in the robber's house helps the girl and is, in her turn, helped by the girl. That is, there is no hierarchy here between mother and daughter, but they both help each other. She helps the, the old woman escape also. Now, the absence of a mother in both the Lucrezia tradition and the judge's story a story contrasts with the presence in all the rape stories by women that I have examined. In Allende's The House of the Spirits, for example, there is a very strong mother figure who dominates the whole novel. And in the women's room, of course, the perspective is the mothers. And in The Rape of Chevy, this wonderful Nigerian tale, the mother of the rape victim has a very important function. The mother explicitly excludes the man, hides her daughter's rape from the man. She doesn't tell her husband and the girl's father. Well, she does tell the daughter's prospective mother-in-law. The daughter who is raped is a princess and is supposed to be engaged to be married to the, um, to the, pr the prince, the future king of Chevy. And because of this rape, cannot marry him. But she, so she does tell, the mother tells the other mother, but they don't tell the man. And she motivates this hiding by telling her daughter the man would only make it worse. Now, while the daughter in the grim tale watches sexual violence against the other girl, this cut off finger falls into her lap. And this moment of extreme danger is also, semiotically speaking, metonymic, synecdochical, as well as metaphoric, an identification with the fellow victim. She is contaminated by the other's blood. Now, a similar idea is visually expressed in the most wonderful painting of Frida Kahlo. I don't know if you know about Frida Kahlo, uh, a recently rediscovered uh, painter, a woman painter who used to be uh, identified more as her husband's wife and is now an independent painter. Um, she has a painting called A Few Little Nips. You see a naked woman entirely cut up with a million wounds over her body. She has only one boot on her leg, which is there to, accent, to, to emphasize the nakedness of the rest of her body. She's lying on a bed. The killer is standing behind her. It's a very impressive painting and very disturbing. Now, the interesting thing is that the blood is everywhere. It's on her body, on the, on the bed, on the floor, and on the frame of the picture. It's just, just it splashes over the frame of the picture. And that's a wonderful idea, of course. It signifies that not only the illusory aspect of framing as a limit of relevance, 
which is a subject we will have to talk about in this seminar. But also, the contamination of the viewer. This is a way to implicate the viewer, to splash the blood on the viewer. And by this bodily identification, the miller's daughter with this finger is, not more, is no more simply metaphorically related to the other girl, as the one stands for the other, as both are moti in comparison motivated by rapeability. But she is also metonymically causally related to her. She is blood stained because the other one has been raped. By appropriating this finger and using it semiotically, you can think of the judge's story. He is also a piece of the, of the raped woman taken away. But by using this piece of the body semiotically, she uses it in the name of the raped woman. She does not use it for another purpose. This girl points out the need for metonymic identification among women. She, in fact, the statement is, all those who are rapable in all countries right, get together. This semiotic use of the finger replaces the political use of the bloody dagger and of the pieces, pieces of flesh. Now, the narrative aspect. The girl narrates her story as if it were a dream. Repeatedly, she utters the refrain, my dear, it was only a dream. And she says that all the time while she's telling it, to reassure the guy. She repeats it so often that its overt purpose, framing the story by reassuring fictionality, is reversed, is overruled by its insistent misfit. If you read the story, you will see that this is it's also evidence for the oral background, by the way, of the story as kind of formulaic uh, sentence. But it's, it's, it's such a misfit in the logic of the story that you know that something else is going on. It's like the, the frame that has the blood splashed on it. Now, by presenting her real story, it's supposed to be her real experience, in this fictional mode, she's able to force the murderer to listen to her and to betray himself to the father and brothers. Now, we've heard this before, right, in Hamlet where Hamlet has this performance stage that tricks Claudius into betraying that he's the murderer of the king. I hope you know this one. Now, this fictionalization of the story, and what I'm getting at is the, the use of fictionalization as a strategy, is also a strategy in The Rape of Chevy, in this so-called fable, this reassuringly denomination, this reassuring denomination being, of course, not appropriate, about the rape of a black young woman in an innocent, virginal African society, Chevy, by an albino who fails to understand the culture. Now, if Grimm's tale's tale ends happily as a fairy tale is supposed to be, it is because the girl's story is well understood, right? It's because everybody understands, hey, this is real, and then they catch the man and bring him to court. Now, if in Amy Geta's fable it ends unhappily, it is because misunderstanding that of the man toward the woman and that of the albino toward the black community is the basis of the behavior of the albino. Now, here's the, again, I quote the, the moment of the rape, the, the moment that the rape is narrated. Ronje, and Ronje is the, the Danish guy who is the rapist. Ronje fell on her and in less than 10 minutes took from the future queen of Chevy what the whole of Chevy stood for. To him, the Chevians were savages and Ayoko, that's the girl's name, was just a servant girl. Oh, the background of this is that the woman had been sweeping the entrance of his cabin as, um, and that was the Chevian way of honoring guests. Here again, you have hospitality, hostility, right? Now, this way of honoring guests was misunderstood. He thought, oh, she must be just a servant girl as if that were a reason to rape her, but, okay. To him, the Chevians were savages, and Ayoko, Ayoko was just a servant girl. Though she fought, cried, and begged, signs that can hardly be misunderstood, her pleading was gibberish to him. Her resistance enhanced the vengeance he was taking on Shona, Shona being his ex-wife who ran off with a black man. So here's again the competition between men, that's the real reason for the rape. Now, rather than considering fiction as innocent, like the robber in the tale who got caught because of his willing suspension of disbelief, it seems relevant to use rape stories in fictional texts as sources which allow us to interpret, to understand the real but inexpressible experience of rape and to replace rivalry and repression of experience with the primacy 
and the understanding its signs require. And I think that what, in fact, um, I've been trying to do in these two sessions is to, to uh, make a claim for the, the use of literature and art for the understanding of real social issues in a way that is not documentary, is not based on the idea that the text is a document of reality. I have tried to avoid that fallacy. Um, but I, what I want to discuss in this seminar is, is, is there another way to say we can learn from literature? The old question, what can we learn from literature? What can we learn from art? And what we have been able to do is by the literary device and the artistic devices used by the artist, we could get at understanding, I think, I hope, of a phenomenon that is absolutely real and yet so difficult to understand and so uh, problematic, therefore, in the culture. Now, I can briefly summarize the statements on rape that we got out of this. And I'm, now I'm really talking about rape itself and not about the works of art. First, rape is language, to be precise, body language. It, it speaks hatred caused by fear and rivalry. Rape is a speech act. It is the publication, the public appropriation of a subject. It turns the victim into a sign, intersubjectively available. Now, this is the background of the fact, and that is statistically evidenced, that uh, married women get b much better treatment in court when they file charges for rape than single women. And the old, if you are a, a kind of a single woman in the 30s, that is, the woman who stands for the professional independent woman, has no chance in court. A married woman the same age has a lot better chances. And that has, has to do, of course, with the idea of uh, availability. A single woman is available anyway, so there's not really rape. Now, thirdly, the speech act means arbitrariness that relates sign to meaning. Therefore, the primary meaning of rape is that the victim becomes anybody's property. Next, the goal of rape, and I really, I know this is a tough claim to make, but I want to maintain it. The goal of rape is the destruction of the victim's subjectivity, necessitated by the problematic self-image of the rapist. This destruction is accomplished, and this is also evidenced if you read like the, 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 the documents in the books on rape, like Rao Miller and uh, Estridge. Um, they say it. Why did you rape this woman? I couldn't stand her independence. Sometimes. Now, this destruction is accomplished by the alienation from the self, from self that ensues from the experience of hatred being spoken in your body by another body, by contiguity. That is, that is kind of, your subjectivity is destroyed because the limits of your body are not acknowledged. And as a consequence of the semiotic nature of rape, the victim, who is a member of the semiotic community in which the rape take, takes place, understands the message thereby entailing the paradox that I have tried to point out. She is destroyed, hence unable to participate in semiosis, but her understanding is absolute precisely because of her destruction. She, she is the only one who possesses the testimony. And just as her body has been appropriated, so her semiotic competence is recuperated. And we have seen that happen in the stories. But you also see that happen in court sessions where rape is discussed and as if it was completely different from what the woman has experienced. As a consequence, the most characteristic result of rape is the victim's agreement with the rapist's hatred of her. And we discussed that as at length last week, this reversal of cause and effect. And we saw it today again. The victim is not only blamed by others, she's also blaming herself. And this is because she is not addressed, not spoken to, but spoken. Somebody speaks through her. And that goes on even after the rape. Now, any change in a culture that aims at putting an end to the proliferation of rape should start at this last point, that is, help survivors to undo their assimilation to the rapist by emphatically refusing their guilt. And in fact, they need, of course, uh, counseling to get rid of that, of that guilt, and that's maybe the most important point. But instead, what happens is that they begin by doubting her testimony, so pursuing this. and and. In a sense, I would say that the, the cultural story of rape, the emblematic cultural story of rape that the story of Lucrezia has always been, 
you know, is a book, for example, and a collection of essays by various people called On Rape. That book has, as the only um, cultural article, a cultural essay or out of cultural sciences, it has Lucretia. That is the emblematic story of rape. That must be replaced by Ayoko's story in Emigreta's novel. I think that is really the emblem of rape, including the relation to politics. Now, the cleaning of the Washington Lucretia, we talked about last week, shows us how this transition can take place. It brought the dying woman back to life by allowing the movements of her arms, uh, the attention they called for. But rather than turning violently against herself as she did, the raped woman should be helped to listen to the other stories of her own movement, that is Lucretia. And that is what Rembrandt, to a certain extent, did allow. And we have seen that the visual reading, with the help of rhetorical concepts, that is, this verbal visual taken together, can mediate what the culture in the name of the rapist tried to suggest and what the experience really is. But this visual rhetoric has a second effect that is equally crucial. Movement introduces narrativity. Right? As soon as you see movement in a painting, you get a sense that you have a narrative painting. And like a narrative, rape is not a single event, but with the cause and the consequence. Narrativity implies it is the end of a story. That is why it equals murder. It leads to the ideal end of all stories, death. The realization of this murderous quality of rape is the first step to an adequate treatment of it in our culture, which looks into the space between verbal and visual expression. And that is why I wanted to discuss this case as a first case in, the, in this seminar that is going to be devoted to the interaction between verbal and visual. So we want to, we want to, what we want to do here is to stay away from any idea that verbal and visual are opposites, are a dichotomy that has been firmly anchored in our culture and, and strengthened by philosophers like Lessing in Laocoon, where he, he really sets them up against each other. And that is precisely what is doing all the damage, what makes it possible to use this rivalry in the sense of a war. I'm sorry this was again so long. I hope that five minutes more than last week. I'm through. Next week will be ten minutes more.